All right, we got a really, really fascinating text to look at today. Um, tell you what, I worked on this earlier this week, and I've been excited the last three or four days to actually talk about this. Really, really neat stuff here we're going to look at. Okay? Uh, so, let's do this. Let's have a quick word of prayer, and we have some brief announcements, and then we'll get into things, okay? So, let's have a brief word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts of your mercy and grace for us. Thank you for your word that imparts to us understanding, that shapes and forms us. Bless our conversation, our time, and our service today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a couple announcements here. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to briefly, um, or we're not going to spend the whole time, I think we'll briefly go over the resolutions. Now, there are a bunch of packs over there. Uh, of these packets like this. These are the resolutions that we'll be voting on at the district convention that begins uh, a week from tomorrow, a week from Monday tomorrow. So then following the service next week, uh, I'm going to, Tim right here, so if you guys know Tim Sutton, Tim and I are going to be heading down for the convention. So we're going to we're going to go out to eat, we're going to go get things organized, and we're going to pick them up here. Um, pick them up either in mine or we'll figure it out. Pick them up somewhere, we're going to head down, pick them up on the side of the road, right? <laughs> and then we're going to head down to Fargo. First time I've been picked up. <laughs> then we're going to head down to Fargo. And uh, so for me as a pastor, each church can have one pastor to represent them. Uh, so I'll be representing St. Paul's, and then you have one lay person which you elected, which was Tim, to represent the church. And we will be doing votes on different uh, uh, people, candidates that have been nominated, and then these resolutions. So, take these home, <clears throat> look through it, and I think we'll, how we'll handle it is uh, I'm going to ask you what resolutions you want to talk about. And if there's resolutions you don't want to talk about, then we won't talk about it, okay? Then Tim and I will use our discernment. But if there's something you want to bring a uh, question to, you can do that. So these packets will be available for you, okay? All right. So, take a look at those this week, and we'll briefly talk about it next week. And uh, if the conversation goes really, really long, we'll do that. If not, then we'll have a study ready, and so we'll play it by ear next week, okay? Sound like a plan? <coughs> All right. Acts 19. Also, by the way, uh, thanks for those of you who asked. Um, I am feeling better. Uh, I'm kicking. So, last week was, was not... Uh, didn't feel the hottest, and so grateful to Pastor Roth kind of helping out. But energy is returned, and uh, we're off and running. So, that's good. Acts 19. Okay, you guys ready? Fast your seatbelts. Ready for this? It's good stuff here. Uh, this is really, really, really good stuff to check out. Okay, Acts 19. Verse 21. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent to Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the works, workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristar oh boy, Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companion in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the, uh, boy, one of those days a lot of his words. Uh, yeah. 
one of you guys said it better than I can, so there you go. <laughs> who were friends of his, sent to him, and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the, quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against any one, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly, for we are really in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Okay, we got a lot to unpack, okay? Okay, but hang, hang with me, okay? A lot to unpack, but hang with me here, okay? All right, look at our sheet. By the very end, I promise you this is going to be crystal clear, and you're going to be like, whoa, this is so cool. Okay? Look at our sheet. <clears throat> it's important to keep in mind that Christianity is not inclusionary, but exclusionary. What does that mean, right off the bat? Now, this is going to be one of the biggest differences between us and liberal Lutherans, okay? such as the ELCA um, and other liberal denominations. We would actually stand uh, with many of the, uh, even like the evangelicals, the Baptists, um, and so forth, many of them, even though some of them are maybe wandering a little bit on this, but for the most part, many of the evangelicals would, would stand shoulder to shoulder with us, that we would say that Christianity is, is exclusionary, it's not inclusionary. In other words, it's important to keep in mind that Jesus claims that he is not a truth or a way, but the truth and the way. In other words, Jesus is not an option among many. Okay? Jesus says very, very definitively in John 14, 6, he goes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's a, what we call a definite article, and that's the. He does not say, I am a way and a truth. And it, the, the, the word a, uh, a way or a truth means it's one of what? Many. But when you say, I am the way and the truth, it's definitive. It's a definite article. He definitely says it. Now, there's all sorts of different ways of writing that in the Greek. But it's very, very clear that it's what? I am the way and the truth. Meaning what? Only one. Okay? So, all right? The Christian faith does not see itself as one option among many other religious options. But instead, it sees itself as the one true faith with a bunch of cults and false demonic religions around it. Okay? Now, this is very important. Now, many years ago, uh, there was a, a, a ELCA president, or not ELCA president, an LCMS president of a district, and I believe it was after World War or the World Trade Centers um, were, were hit. They had a, 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 some sort of demonstration at uh, the Yankee Stadium, I believe it was. Yeah, it was... Yeah, and I'm, I'm, and I was a Missouri Senate at the time, but I heard about it even in when I was in my other denomination. They had a bunch of religious people side by side by side on a field, and they all what prayed. One prayed to uh, Buddha. One was praying what to Muhammad or not Muhammad, but uh, but uh, Allah. You know, and they had a bunch of different people. And he had a Missouri Senate uh, district president, and he was standing shoulder to shoulder, and he prayed right there. And so what did it do? What did it do? It communicated what. Unity that we're all what kind of in this together. Now, here's the thing: the problem with that district president, and he was by looking at back on it and looking at it, he was so wrong, and it, and it made all a bunch of people all defensive. But no, he needed, and I don't really know the rest of the story, but he needed to repent. He was completely wrong. It would have been completely appropriate if he would have stood up there and he would have prayed, and when he got done praying, say, "I pray this in the name of the only one true God, Jesus Christ, God of God." Mighty, mighty, the one true God, amen. He would have been fine there. Because if he would have done that, what would he have done? 
He would have excluded himself, and he would have what? Differentiated himself from everybody else. And But he didn't do that. He prayed very generically, which then made him look a part of what? The whole group, everyone else. You see what I'm saying? And so there's nothing wrong. I would have zero problem being on that field and praying. Uh, but if you pray, you got to make sure it's very, very perfectly clear that there's what? One true God. And everybody else is what? A bunch of frauds. Okay? Now, would that take courage to do? You bet. Um, so thinking back on that, district president should have the courage to do that. Or he should have what? Not shown up at all. See what I'm saying? Uh, so Christianity is very exclusionary. It's not inclusionary. Okay? So Jesus is not just an optional on many. Okay? And so the result of Christianity's exclusionary aspect is that once a person converts to Christianity, he or she drops their ties to their previous religious superstitions. Unlike many ideologies of the world, Christianity does not allow itself to blend with Islam, Hinduism, or other false religions. It cannot syncretize, that's, that's a big word, or blend or unite with a false religion. One cannot do a smorgasbord religion using Christianity as one option among many. Do you remember the old royal fork here in Minot? Oh, that was good. I missed that place, right? Do you remember? I always, I think back, I miss that place, but I'm always angry, that guy who had the roast beef with the knife, and he's like, he'd cut off and give you a little thin slice, and you're like, more? And you're like, give me another thin slice, like, like more, right? Um, but with the smorgasbord, you come, and what happens? Take a little bit of this, a little potatoes, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and you pick and choose, and you make, what, this big, beautiful plate, right? Uh, that's how many people approach spirituality. They take little aspects of all these different things. Christianity does not allow you to do that. So if you imagine, if you have a smorgasbord plate, <clears throat> okay, if you have a smorgasbord plate, and you want to come up, and you want to get a little bit of potatoes, a little bit of uh, uh, rice, and or maybe a little bit of uh, corn, and all this stuff, and maybe get some, you know, whatever, and you come over to that guy, and you try to take some roast beef, Christianity would be like, what? Slapping the hand and say, what? You need a, what? A different plate. See what I'm saying? So Christianity doesn't allow itself to be a smorgasbord, okay? And this does happen in many different uh, places in the world where they attempt to take local cultural aspects and they blend it with Christianity and you have this molding of what? It sounds like Christianity, but it functions kind of like their, their pagan religion. And that's what we call syncretism. And it gets really messy. Now, here's the thing to keep in mind. I was talking to a friend this week about this. This is the reason why when the nation of Israel would come into different pagan nations, that the different pagan nations that did not repent, this is why the armies were told to what? Destroy everything. They destroyed their cattle. They destroyed the people. They destroyed everything because it was so intent and purpose that they did not want these two, what? To syncretize. And also many of these nation states were opposed to the gospel, opposed to the seed, the promised seed of of Christ coming, so there was what? If they're going to stand in opposition, just like David and Goliath, right? Goliath was trying to stand in the way of what? The promised Messiah. So guess what? His head was cut off, right? Okay? So the fact of the matter is this, that Christianity cannot blend, and as soon as you blend it with another religion, what do you do? You lose Christianity. I heard it once said before, and I love this little analogy, what do you get when you take... Uh, ice cream and manure and you mix them, what do you get? <laughs> Farmers? You get manure, right? Now, hopefully not chocolate ice cream, right? <laughs> when you blend ice cream and manure, you get manure. And that's what happens, okay? So the fact of the matter is this, is Christianity cannot blend, it cannot be syncretized with the world religions. Okay, so now, here's the implications of this, okay? While Christianity's exclusionary zeal may be difficult to swallow for some people, the effects or the fruit of this exclusionariness creates dramatic ripples in culture. The consequence or result of Christianity's exclusionary theology stretches far and wide into people's pocketbooks, habits, worldviews, and so forth. Take, for example, Acts 19. Okay, so to say that there's only one true God, okay, to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, not a way and not a truth, there are going to be ramifications of that. Okay, so let's see how this is played out in Acts 19. Okay, you guys with me so far? Okay, all right, so in Acts 19, we're introduced to a silversmith named Demetrius. He opposed Christianity because when Paul evangelized, 
the message of Christianity exposed that the goddess Artemis was fake. Now, I believe um, Artemis was the name of, of one of the Greek gods, and she was one of the, um, what they call the pantheon, right? You had Zeus, and you had all these guys. And so, so she was one of the main ones, okay? So she was, she was one of the main, uh, they call it the pantheon, is it? Uh, so she was one of the main ones. Um, I think her Roman name was Diana, or Diane. Um, but Artemis is how it's translated here. So you have Artemis, and she was one of the main gods of that time of the Roman culture. So <clears throat> what happened was this, is when Paul was evangelizing to Christ, when people started to convert to Christianity, what did they do with the Greek gods? They, they, they disregarded them. They, they, they left it. Okay? They, didn't, they didn't pay homage to it. Okay? So they didn't give business towards it. Okay? So simply stated, Demetrius made silver souvenirs. He was a silversmith. He made little models or temple boxes made of silver. Now, we don't really know exactly what they were like. And here's the reason why. It's kind of an interesting tidbit. Archaeologically speaking, we can't go back and find these little things because they were made of what? Silver. Was silver valuable? Yes. Then what happened is if you came across and you didn't believe in Artemis, but you came across a little silver box, would you throw it away or would you melt it down? you melt it down. So a lot of things that were made with silver and gold we don't have artifacts for because unless they were put in a tomb of a fancy what king, we don't have because what would happen is they many times would melt them down or they would take a portion of that and make a coin and they would use it for bartering and so forth. Yep? A few months ago, I was listening to <laughs> driving around the country, and they were talking about the Catholic artifacts mm -hmm. that somebody made who was producing all these little trinkets. Yep. And then they had to take these trinkets by the crate hole, and if they visited seven of the holy places, yep. then they could be labeled as an artifact and sold as such. Yep. Fascinating, huh? Yeah. So... <clears throat> Yeah. I mean, Martin Luther spoke about that. Yeah, we have this way of um, having tangible things. We like, you know, I mean, look, the golden calf, right? Way back in Exodus. So what we, we don't know exactly what they were like, but, but we, we speculate that they were either. Now keep in mind, the, the temple for Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the world. We're going to get to this in a little bit. So if you actually Google Artemis' temple, they have a drawings of what it would look like in the first century. Um, now, there's, it still stands, parts of it, like a couple pillars, still stand today, and the foundation is still in, 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 in Ephesus right now, you can find. But it was one of the seven wonders of the world, and so people would, what, come and visit it. So if you came there, <clears throat> you pulled up in town, and, you know, it's like going to a baseball game, right? So when you come to a baseball game, um, I'm just thinking, let's just pick on... Okay, I've been to the Cardinals before, uh, quite a few games in the Cardinals and St. Louis. And you come and, you know, you walk in and they always have these people, what, get your souvenirs here, right, so get your book. And then, and then, and then all of a sudden it's like, man, I remember I went to a St. Louis Cardinals game and I had a Boston Red Sox hat on, not smart. And, <laughs> and so it's like, okay, I better get a hat, right, to take it off and put it on. Right? So, you, so you get these souvenirs, right, that there's, you come into town. So the same thing here, you come in to Ephesus, you're going to go see Artemis' temple and, and then pay homage to that and, and see how impressive the facility is, one of the seven wonders of the world. And you come up and there's Demetrius is making this little silver. It's like, oh, that's kind of cute. It's like, honey, you want one? It's like, yeah, because like, daddy, I want one. Okay, great. So we'll get a, like a little, either a little box. And you open it up, silver, and it has a picture of the goddess Artemis on it. Or maybe it was a little temple and it, and it had a little, little shrine on it. Regardless, it was basically a souvenir. Okay? So that makes sense? So the reason uh, to believe that Artemis, or to see, Demetrius may have been a civil magistrate and possibly employer of multiple silversmiths. So <clears throat> we, 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 we have reason to believe through some archaeological evidence that he may have been a civil magistrate. He may have been a, what, a very prominent businessman in town. Okay? So, okay, imagine this. Prominent businessman in the town of Ephesus. He employs multiple silversmiths. He's dealing with silver, which was what? Expensive. People were coming in for tourism because of Artemis' temple. He's making these little boxes. Paul then is what? Saying that there's only one God, so then what happens? That's a threat to what? It's a threat to tourism, 
and threat to the souvenirs, which is ultimately threat to what? The pocketbook, right? So furthermore, keep in mind that in Ephesus there was a temple for the goddess Artemis, which we talked about. The temple is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that attracted thousands of people to, to Ephesus. The point, though, is Christianity grew and spread. It consequen consequently eroded the false gods of the Roman Empire. If there's only one god, then Artemis was a false goddess, a fake. And if Artemis was a fake, then her temple was a fake. And if her temple was nothing, then people would perhaps stop coming to Ephesus for tourism and stop buying souvenirs. And if tourism slowed down and the buying of souvenirs declined, then Demetrius's business would fail and profits would stop, leaving everyone broke and their livelihoods shattered. Wow, huh? Big. And so it is important to understand the false goddess Artemis not only brought about tourism dollars to Ephesus, but also brought about souvenir dollars. Furthermore, this false goddess also had multiple festivals attached to her. Yes, the culture and the habits and the customs of Ephesus were influenced by Artemis too. And so Christianity's exclusionary aspect not only attacked the false goddess Artemis, but it also threatened Ephesus's tourism, economy, culture, habits, and customs. Okay? So <clears throat> the way to think of this is this. We think throughout, let's just think throughout America right now, okay? The different customs that we have, okay? So I'm going to name a couple of cities. I want you to see what kind of customs you can kind of pick out, okay? So think of uh, New Orleans, Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. Uh, see if we get this one Chicago, St. Patrick's Day, right? Yeah, yeah, that's in Chicago a lot. Um, let's think of Mina. What do we have here in Mina? Who's fast? Yeah, <laughs> right. Who's who's fast? Yeah. Uh, what are some other other little festivals that we have? State fair. State fair. Yeah. Um, culturally, just think some cultural different festivals that are throughout you know North America. Sturgis. Sturgis. Yeah. So think think of think of South Dakota. What do they have? They have Sturgis, right? Here's, here's a good one. Minneapolis. Yeah. What? Yeah, they have a big pride parade in Minneapolis. Yep. What else here? What's that? Vegas. Yeah. Think of Vegas. Vegas is just one big party all year long, right? Yeah. So the the point being, the point being is think about this here. There are things that happen in culture, <laughs> things that happen in culture, and oftentimes we don't even realize it. But even think of Christmas itself. The, 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 the aspect of Christmas is derived from Christianity. And so we have many, many, many people in America right now that enjoy the benefits and the blessings of a Christmas season. And they may not even be Christians, but they are what? They're, they're, they're hopping on what? Something that came as a fruit of Christ's birth, right? Um, Easter, right? It's tied to the resurrection. And so what do people do? They don't want the resurrection, so they throw Jesus out and they, what, let's, let's have a bunny, <laughs> right? You know, um, Mardi Gras, right, down in, in Louisiana, uh, not Louisiana, uh, yeah, New Orleans, right? Uh, Mardi Gras, now imagine, let, let's just say, imagine this. Let's just say right before Mardi Gras, we have the capacity to go down to New Orleans, and I don't know how we do it, but let's just say we could go to New Orleans, and we started stripping away at the very core of Mardi Gras, and that people would stop doing Mardi Gras. What would happen if all of us could go down to New Orleans and we could actually implement something, or you know, how we could we could introduce something that could what pull people away from Mardi Gras? And again, I don't know what we would do, but 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 let's just say we do that. How would the the, the culture treat us? They would what? Spit you out. Why? Because you're threatening. We would be threatening what? Their culture, their, their, their way of life, their economy, all those things that that brings to them, right? Now, I would, I would conclude that in Ephesus, if we went to Ephesus in the first century, I don't think we would automatically find a bunch of devout and zealous people worshiping Artemis. 
So many of these individuals, they appreciated Artemis because of the tourism that that Artemis and the temple brought to Ephesus. And they appreciate the festivals that developed around Artemis as a way of what? As a pattern for their daily lives. And then all of a sudden you pull Artemis out, then you feel that affects potentially threatening your culture and your tourism and your money. So what ends up happening? You get very violent, very angry, very responsive, right? Okay? So look, let's see what happens here. It makes sense why Demetrius and the people became so enraged in 1928, verse 1928. It's, it's actually a fierce wrath. The word is, it's a fierce wrath with heavy breathing. Okay, so it says, <clears throat> when they heard this, they were enraged. So this is, Demetrius starts addressing the crowd, and he's basically pointing to the fact that this Paul guy is introducing Jesus, and Artemis might not be here. And if Artemis is not here, then guess what? We could lose everything, right? And people then became what? Enraged. And that means to have a wrath with heavy breathing. Okay? Have you ever been that angry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so, you know, you know what this is? Okay. So, for me, this is what this is, looks like. Oh, yeah. This is like me watching YouTube and watching politics on my day off and just watching and, and saying, ooh. <laughs> right? See? So, ooh, and then you like you breathe, you let the ooh, right? That's that's that rage, right? So that's that's their anger that's being on displayed here. Okay? So they have this wrath with heavy breathing because of the effects of the exclusionariness of the gospel that's threatening the god Artemis, which then will trickle down and affect all these different ways of their life. So then they develop what? Wrath with heavy breathing. And then this develops into a full-fledged riot and a mob mentality. Okay? So this is, but what about the riot and the confusion? Okay? So frankly stated, many of the people in Ephesus developed a mob and riot mentality. Okay? I want to pause there before we go to the mob and the riot. It's really fascinating to look at it. Any thoughts so far? It always boils down to money. It, yeah. Yep. Money, sex, and power. Yeah. So <clears throat> many of these people, now Demetrius, how did he how did he have power in the city? If, he, if it is indeed true he was a civil magistrate, he had, he had influence in the city because he made lots of money through what? The silversmith. So he also had power. So Demetrius was going to lose what? Money and power. Now, I don't want to go into this too much, but there is, um, and it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just in the ditch, you know. But I will, I will share with you too. There's reason to believe too that there was a lot of sexual promiscuity that was tied to the goddess Artemis too. And so there's a lot of sexual promiscuity, and that phrase. Talk to me afterwards. I'll explain to you a little bit more about this. This phrase. What some commentaries are saying. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The, the origin of that phrase. Long story short, too. If you remove Artemis, you can also remove what? The sexual promiscuity that was endorsed or was at least celebrated in the festivals tied to her. So you're losing the potentiality of what? Money, power, and sex. And that's what's on the line. And tell you what, people will fight, fight a lot to have their money and their power and their sex. It's all okay. degradation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Make it sense? Okay. Okay, ready to jump to the next section? Question in here. I, I turned the heat on the other day in here for the Bible. Say a little warm in here? Yeah. Okay. Can we can we crack that door open back there? <coughs> just open up a little bit. Dana, you mind open up this window just a little bit let air flow in here? Okay. Okay. All right. Is it hot, cold? Okay. Okay, we'll cool down just a little bit, okay? A lot of hot air coming from up here, right? Okay, so let's deal with the riots, okay? This is really cool. There are stages to riots. It's clearly seen in Acts 19, okay? 
Now, this is very applicable because in the last, in 2020, we, we saw a lot with riots, okay? And uh, a riot is nothing new, okay? Nothing new at all, okay? <clears throat> so there are stages to riots as clearly seen in Acts 19. First, with every mob and or riot, there's always the one who stirs. There's always a mastermind, a wizard behind the screen. So who is the wizard behind the screen in Acts 19? Demetrius. Demetrius, yeah. Now it makes sense because he was a position of uh, power and influence, people who knew him, okay? Uh, so, you know, sometimes if you look, if you look to a, a, you look to a riot, generally speaking, in a mob, generally speaking, you're not going to have a person of insignificance being able to stir. It's usually a person of what? Significance and influence. Usually a person who has good rhetoric, right? Able to, to articulate. Okay? <clears throat> so there's a mastermind, a wizard behind the screen. In the case of Acts 19, the one who is stirring is Demetrius. Secondly, the mastermind stirs the group of people into a rage. Keep in mind that the mastermind stirs a group to rage because they have no solid comeback or solid argument towards their predicament. Okay? Rage becomes a tool of revenge or leveraging tool to get what they want. Now, keep in mind, uh, when it comes to you and I, when we're debating with somebody or conversing with somebody, what typically happens if you start losing a debate? What happens to the person that's losing? They get angry. Okay? I know when I debate individuals or I converse with people, and I, I try to behave lately, more lately, the last couple of years online, but I would poke and I would poke and I would poke individuals online, and then all of a sudden they would blow up. And as soon as they blow it up, they blow up, I'm like, yes. <laughs> right? Because then that shows that what? You yep, that, that, you, that you're winning. And so what typically happens is, is this, is you're debating with somebody back and forth. Let's just say I'm going to debate with Josh back and forth, and, and, and all of a sudden Josh says something back to me, and, and it's like, ah, I don't know how to respond. And I'll say, well, well, well. You're stupid, right? You know, you, 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 you've seen that before. Like you see that with little kids, they're back and forth, and finally they get to the point where they can't win the argument. So then they what? They attack the person. You know, they they they, they you, you have a weird looking shirt, or you know, uh, you, you go for some other desperate attempt of attack, and that wrath comes out because you're what not being able to infiltrate or make your point. In this case. What happened is this, is that he stirred the group to rage. And the reason being is this was a tool, this rage was a tool to get leverage over Paul and the disciples and also a way to intimidate what they were doing to push them back where? Into their corner or push them out of Ephesus. It was a way to defend their silver market of trinkets and their tourism and their power. And so the rage was raised up among the crowd to get them to what? To push that back. So once enraged, the rage will spread like a wildfire. Angry people will stir up other people, resulting in each person losing their individual consciousness and being pulled along in the dynamic of a larger group's anger. Now, I'm pulling this from a French philosopher who, who uh, this is about 200 years ago, I read his book on, on, on riots. Last year I wrote it. I read it, um, and uh, and he was talking about what happens is this is that once the rage gets brewing in a group, what happens is we get drawn into the group mentality. So we talk about lemmings, right? The lemmings will follow in the, the whole thing about lemmings will follow one lemming off of a cliff. What happens is we get caught up in the drama of a group. And we've all done this. We've been in a group. What's going on? And everybody's all huffed up. Whoa, what's going on? And then, whoa, wait. And then you get sucked into it. And next thing you know, you're what? You're enraged too, right? And this is what happened here. They're, they're enraged. They're angry. They're frustrated because Demetrius has stirred them up. Okay? So we see that in 1928. When they heard this, they shouted. They were enraged. Shout, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with the confusion and people rushed together and theater and dragging with them, Gaius and, and so forth. There's this rage that's going, okay? Thirdly, once angry, the group will be driven to actions such as yelling, demonstrating, destroying property, beating people, and so forth. What do they do here? Demetrius stirred them up 
They got angry, full of rage. And did they just stay in the streets yelling? They were driven to action. The rage drove them to action. They actually gathered together. They're dragging with them some of Paul's contemporaries, some of his traveling companions. Okay, so if you're reading this for the first time, you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, they're going to what? They're going to be slaughtered. They're going to be lynched. They're going to be what? I mean, decapitated. I mean, they're going to be beaten to death, stoned to death, right? Okay, so number one, there's a wizard behind the screen. The screen. Number two, driven to rage. Number three, they're driven to action. Fourthly, <clears throat> because the individuals lose a self-consciousness in a larger group, and are driven by rage of the mob, which is being stirred and directed by the mastermind behind the screen, there will be much confusion. They often won't understand the exact reason and or details why they're upset or angry. See verse 32. It says this, Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some were shouting another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Isn't that crazy? Why are you here? Well, we don't know. We're just angry. That makes sense? Um, I think that is very, very characteristic when you have a group. And I'm, I've, I've asked this too, and I, I recall in a past church, we had a lot of people who were angry one time. We had a big assembly meeting. And uh, we had a lot of people that were angry. And one of the questions I asked is, can you please help me understand why you're angry? And could they define it? No, they couldn't. They were just angry. Okay? Um, so that is very, very common amongst a mob or a riot. There's a lot of emotion, a lot of commotion, and not necessarily knowing why. Okay? We could probably pull that classic quotes going on. <laughs> not just you. There's a couple. Of, yeah, so pull that. Okay. So does that make sense? So then, then what happens is they don't really know why. Okay? Okay. They often won't understand the exact reasons and the details why they're upset. See verse 32. And so we're going to review this. And so fifthly, this is really interesting. Good order will only be restored either when the mob or the riot fizzles out of energy or when the mastermind quits his stirring. But why or how would the mastermind quit his stirring? Well, quite simply, the mastermind quits stirring when the curtain is pulled back and they are called out. Take note of Acts 19.35 and following, where the powerful town clerk called up Demetrius and the um, Artesians. So look at the town clerk in verse 35. This is not just a little like bookkeeper. The town clerk of Ephesus was not just a little bookkeeper who, who uh, you know, had a petty cash fund. The town clerk at that time was a very powerful person who had contact with the proconsul with basically the governing authorities in the army. So the town clerk was what? A big hitter. And he stands before them and he calls out who? He calls out the wizard. He pulls the curtain back. And he goes right to the source of the problem, right to the source of the riot. And he puts pressure where? On the wizard, the mastermind. And then once the wizard and the mastermind is exposed and called out, then what happened to the crowd? They fizzle because the mastermind is hiding behind who? He's hiding behind the riot. He's hiding behind the crowd. The crowd. He's the one that's stirring it. So anytime you see a riot or a crowd, you have to understand that generally speaking, that doesn't start by itself. It isn't like you know you're on the street and let's just say there's going to be a riot here in Minot, and all of a sudden we're walking along, around, and all of a sudden at the exact same time a bunch of people independently just get angry and want to break things. You know, it's just like you're walking down the street and all of a sudden, oh my goodness, I feel angry, and then a person three blocks there, I just feel a sense of anger too, and all of a sudden we just join together. We're angry, and we're going to what? Throw, throw a riot. That doesn't happen that way. There has to be one who is what. Stirring a mastermind. That was what Demetrius. So behind every right, there's a mastermind, a wizard that stirs. And then he what? Moves them to rage. They lose consciousness. They don't know why they're angry. And they're driven to action. And the whole time along, they're being what? Stirred by what? The mastermind. That is until they lose enough energy and they just what? Oh, okay, I've been angry for, for, for a day and a half. Okay, I... Time to go home, right? You know, no more energy. Or the mastermind is called out, 
and exposed, and then the mastermind then feels the pressure, and then what? Pulls back. Okay? So keep in mind, the rage and the riot was for a purpose of what? Money and power. But here's the sad thing. The mastermind, the wizard, is doing what? He's actually using the populace and the people for his own agenda. Because ultimately, who had probably the most to lose? Demetrius. Now imagine, can you imagine this? <coughs> imagine this huge riot, and Roman, Roman authorities were called in, and the Roman, Roman authorities were called in, and all of a sudden the army comes in, and there's a big riot, and the Roman uh, authorities, the, the soldiers come in, and they come in, they move on the riot, and they come in with their swords and their, 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 their shields, and I would assume, I, I don't know this for sure, but I would assume that, that Roman soldiers would not come in with, what, mace and little, little bats or rubber bullets. They would come in with potentially what? I'm assuming swords, right, and, and wrath. So at the very end of the day, the riot is put down, and what happens to all the people rioting? They're dead, or they're bleeding, or they're losing limbs and arms. And you would, you would suspect that what happens to the mastermind when he sees the Roman Empire coming, the Roman soldiers coming, what would the mastermind do? He'd run. This tail between his legs, he'd run back to his house. I don't know what's going on. There's just people are all angry, right? I just, I don't know what's going on. This is terrible. Oh my goodness. Can you, and then he goes and, oh, ah, I don't know. I mean, who knows, right? See, that's how the mastermind would work. Because the mastermind is what? Coward, right? Yeah, that has no integrity. Okay? But what if he isn't called out? Well, if he's not called out, then what's going to happen is the mastermind potentially was going to keep on what? Stirring to, to result in getting the riot to accomplish what he would want, which would ultimately be taking Paul. So what did they do with Paul? Paul wanted to go there. What did they do? They said they, Paul wished to go to the crowd, but the disciples would what? You know, why, why, did they, why did they not let him? Now, I can imagine being Paul, right, in that time. Um, I can imagine being Paul, and I said, you know, gosh, I don't know what's going on. I just, let me just go talk to them, right? You know, hey guys, I'm gonna, if I'm a Paul, I'm just going to go talk to them. I, there's some big misunderstanding. I'm going to go talk to them. And you're like, you're like, what? No, Paul. If you go there, what's going to happen? They're going to kill you. They're going to see you, and they're going to incite the region. And then, so if you go, there, so if I'm Paul and I went there, and Demetrius saw me and identified me, what do you think Demetrius would have done? He would have what? Sturdy. There he is. He's the one. He's the problem. Then what happens? Let's kill him. If we kill him, then what? It'll be all good. Right? And in a sense, that's what, what, what actually was desired to have happen, was to alleviate the problem, the threat. Okay? So yeah, so if, if, if the, the, the mastermind is not called out, typically speaking, the crowd will keep on going in order to accomplish said objective. Right? Okay? But if the mastermind is called out, then they feel the pressure, generally speaking, and they what? Pull back. Fascinating, huh? What are the thoughts on this? That still happens today. Oh yeah, absolutely. Nothing changes. It still happens. In small rooms, sometimes in <clears throat> Yep. Yep. This is why, I want us to think about this here. This is why, uh, pretty interesting, this is why we have, in a lot of ways, we have parliamentary procedure. Okay? This is why we have meetings that are public meetings. <clears throat> so when we have a public meeting, typically speaking, if you have a motion on the floor, you, if you want to speak to it, you stand up to the microphone and you simply say, you identify yourself by name. My name is Matt Richard. This is where I'm from. This is who I represent. So there's what? No mask, right? And I'm speaking on behalf of what? me. Now, if I got up and I said, well, I'm, all these people, I'm talking to these people, I would, I would actually, if I heard a person say that, I'd say, call to order, the person should be speaking what? For themselves, not for a mysterious group of people. Let those people come up and speak the microphone if they need to speak. So then you identify who you are, your identity, who you are, so there's no what secrets. And then at the very beginning, before you actually speak, technically speaking, you're supposed to identify, are you for the motion or against the motion? So that your agenda is stated what? Very clearly. And then each person speaks for themselves. And so then there is no what? Puppets. There's no um, mastermind. 
that everybody's called out to speak clearly and openly. Letting your yes be yes and your no be no, right? Yes? I was just thinking how many times Paul did speak to large groups, <clears throat> and I think the difference here is they've gone beyond reason. And yeah. He's used to reasoning with these large groups of people. Yeah. This is a yeah, you can't reason with a mob. And I would say that you can't reason with somebody who is enraged like this. So when, when a person is so enraged, um, a person so unhinged, my, my understanding, my suggestion would be, and also what we can glean from this, is sometimes when a person is so enraged, you just, what, back off, right? Back off. Unless you're like me, I sometimes like to poke from a distance. <laughs> Shame on me. Right? Poke, and you're going to walk away. Poke, right? <laughs> and you walk away. Make sense? This is, just, this is good stuff, huh? I don't see anybody sleeping here, so... Because uh, I'm excited about this. I think this is really cool. So, I'm mean, looking at you guys. Well, I don't see anybody sleeping, so that's good. Right? But fascinating, huh? Fascinating stuff. So, yeah, I think uh, Serenity brings a really good point. The reason why Paul cannot visit with this group is because they, they lost all sensibility all rationale. They've been driven to rage. And when rage kicks in, you don't think clearly. It just runs through your veins, right? Okay? Uh, very dangerous. Mobs are very, very, very dangerous. <clears throat> and they're dangerous because they are the fruit and the result of a, of a mastermind that's manipulating. And, and tragically speaking, like I said, tragically speaking, the person that loses out at the very end is typically the mob themselves, right? And typically, which is what we've seen in the past decade. Um, I'm thinking of, of Baltimore. I remember watching the Baltimore riots that happened. Uh, this would have been many years ago. And the, the, the mayor of Baltimore was not gonna call. I remember said the mayor will not call out the National Guard. And I just looked at the TV and I'm like, like why call out the National Guard? These people don't know what they're doing. They're destroying their own town. And three nights of, of destruction resulted in what? Years, years upon years of repair and, and, and detriment to the actual culture itself. And so my thing was, no, don't call, I wasn't like calling the National Guard to show them, to show them who's in charge. I'm like, call the National Guard to prevent them from hurting themselves and, and, and their area. Sell the National Guard to protect them and actually do what is right and good, right? Uh, to protect them, right? To protect them from their rage that they don't see what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Minneapolis going through that town? Yep, absolutely. And that's the tragedy. And that should make us, anytime we see a mob, there should be a sense where we're frustrated with it, but more than anything else, we should see, when we see a mob, we should actually weep. We should weep and we should be, we should, we should be sorrowful because we would see what a mastermind is actually what manipulated them to that point. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good stuff, guys. Okay. Good stuff. Let's pick up on Acts 20 next week, and uh, let's pray, okay? <clears throat> I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For in your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right. Thanks, you guys.